Now let me just review where we are, just the last part. You know how I do it. I back up and kind of tell you where we are, at least the way I understand it, in the flow of, of Peter's thought here. Now in chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, Peter says that he wants to arouse their pure intention by having them recall the prophetic word about the Messiah's coming in judgment that he had, he had mentioned in chapter 1, verse 19. He wants them to recall that truth, those Old Testament prophecies of Messiah's coming in judgment, which means Christ is returning, which means the false teachers are selling baloney. Okay, so this idea of arousing their pure intention by having them recall the prophetic word about the Messiah's coming in judgment and having them recall... Christ's insistence that they live righteously as disciples, this command that had been the apostles had passed on to them, that they follow faithfully Jesus Christ, which is an important thing. And he indicates that they are seeing in the false teachers. Remember, he's been combating these false teachers. He's writing from the mid 60s from Rome, he's on the verge of his own execution, and he's combating these false teachers who are coming in. And they are disturbing the faith of people and trying to pull them toward a heresy that denies the coming of Christ in judgment and then has a, a, an aspect of immorality to it tied to that where they're saying, listen, you know, it's, it doesn't matter how you live essentially. Well, he says that they're seeing in the false teachers fulfillment of earlier predictions that mockers would arise in the last days. And the last days, as you see emphasized in the New Testament, began with Christ's redemptive work, and I talked about that a little bit last week. So the last days began with his redemptive work, and these false teachers, they were people who, while indulging their lusts, which is something that he says in 3, 1 to 7, they mock the idea of Christ's return in judgment. So here they are. They are the mockers, or not the mockers. They are an example of fulfillment of that prior prediction that mockers would arise in the last days. There they are. It's the last days. And here are these people mocking the notion of Christ's return in judgment. They asserted that the physical world had always been characterized by continuity and stability, and thus that it was foolish to expect the kind of radical transformation of the world that was, was taught would occur in conjunction with Christ's return. So here you have apostolic teaching that Christ is going to return to consummate the kingdom he initiated or inaugurated. And with that, there's going to be this radical transformation of reality. And you have these people saying, that's nonsense. All things go on as they always have. There's continuity and stability since the beginning of creation. So they're sitting here, they're, they're saying, no, that's all, that's not true. This idea of this, this radical coming of Christ with this radical transformation isn't going to happen. That stuff that you're being told that's based on myths and, and wives' tales and that kind of thing. And because of their desire for sin, they are unappreciative of the fact that God's word, by his powerful word, he had previously, he'd had a dramatic physical effect on the physical world, hadn't he? He says because of their want for sin, they are unappreciative or unaware of that fact. They conceal that fact, will not accept that fact, that by his powerful word, word, he had previously had a tremendous effect on the physical world. He brought it into existence. He would had a tremendous effect on the physical world in the creation event, and then also in what you could call the uncreation event of Noah's flood. You see, he, he, that was by his powerful word, and that same powerful word has reserved the present heavens and earth for fire in the day of judgment. And he wants them to understand that there is a day coming, an accounting coming. And that's important because eschatology, how we understand the end game, what is happening, the ultimate goal of God has ethical ramifications. It's not simply abstract theology where I just want to know this to know it. It isn't that an interesting fact. It feeds into how a person lives Chapter, in chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, he cautions his readers not to allow the apparent slowness of Christ's return to become a cause for doubting the certainty of that return. See, he tells them that, look, God operates in his own perspective or dimension of time. He operates in his own perspective or dimension of time with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. 
So God cannot be judged by human perceptions of slowness. You have people here saying, listen, it's been decades now. We're in the mid-60s. We're talking from from A.D. 30, now we're, what, 35 years down the road? And they're saying, come on, you need to give it up. You need to give it up. This isn't happening. And Peter, by inspiration, says, listen, you can't judge God by human perceptions of slowness. Because he operates in his own sphere, his own dimension, his own perception. You can't come and sit and say that you're taking too long. You just need to sit tight. (laughs) You see, because with him, a day is a thousand years, a thousand years a day. So what for you would be eons, it's like that for him. And that's an important thing to see. Very important, because now we're, we're out in millennia. And you can see people saying, and I, I really think the church has lost its sense and it, of the importance of Christ coming. We don't live with that awareness. They say, like, you know, that's been so long. We can't do anything with that. Just forget about that. Let's not talk about his coming, what it will mean. Let's not talk about living in light of that. That's ah, been, you know, it's too long. Nobody wants to hear that. I think when we do that, we fall and pray to this notion. That it's been too long, let's not worry about it. All right, however long God chooses to wait before sending Jesus, he is definitely going to send him. He's definitely going to send him. And at Christ's return, creation will get the ultimate makeover, passing through the purifying fire. Now, when we ended, we were looking at chapter 3, verses 11 to 13. And that's where I'm going to pick back up. I'll repeat a bit of what I said, as you know how I do it. All right, chapter 3, verses 11 to 13. Since all these things are thus being dissolved, what sort of people ought you, ought you to be with regard to holy forms of conduct and godly deeds while awaiting and hastening the coming, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved by being set on fire and the elements will melt by being burned? But in accordance with his promise, we are awaiting a new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. See, given the certainty of his final, consummating, history-ending judgment, that judgment that he's just described, given the certainty of that, he asked what kind of people should they be with regard to godly living as they expectantly wait for and hasten the coming of that day? It's a rhetorical question. Well, you know what kind of people you should be. You should be people who live lives that reflect your allegiance to Christ. You should be people who live holy lives so that you will be on the desirable side of that final, consummating, history-ending judgment. What is going to wrap this reality up? You want to be on the right side of that. So he says, given that this is certainly happening, what what kind of people should you be with regard to godly living? Well, you ought to be people who live godly lives. That's the kind of people you should be. Holy lives. So that we will, you know, lives that reflect commitment and allegiance to Christ instead of lives that show that that profession is bogus. Because as I've said many times, anybody can say the words, Jesus is Lord. If you mean those words, there will inevitably be a difference in how you live. That strikes me as obvious. Like if I say, I, you know, I am joining the revolution, well, that, if that is a sincere commitment, you're going to see that work out in my life. If I become a Christian and pledge my life to Christ, who then fills me with His Spirit and works to transform me, then all the more you will see transformation in my life. And so that's what he's talking about. Now the question, it's, it's rhetorical. As I say, they, they need to understand that, look, you're to, you're to live godly lives. And he doesn't explain, this is where we ended, he doesn't explain how disciples can hasten the coming of the day of God while they expectantly await it. It's just interesting. Now I'm going to give you my guess on what he's talking about. I think he has in mind endurance of the persecution and the suffering that come with living for God in this sinful world. Living for God in this dark world brings suffering and persecution. The world doesn't like that. And you say, why do you think that? Well, look what they did to Jesus. He was perfect. 
a perfect man. And how did the world respond to him? The world crucified him. And we are his disciples. So why do we think that, no, 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 it's going to be different for us? So this idea, I think he's talking about endurance of persecution and suffering. You remember, he's ready to be executed. And the prior letter he referred to may well have been 1 Peter. He could have written 1 Peter to them. And 1 Peter is loaded with the idea of, listen, you need to endure suffering. You need to endure persecution. I think that's what he's talking about. Now, it seems, it seems from Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 to 11, that there is a predetermined quantity of Christian suffering that will occur before Christ's return. If you see there, he talks about the full number of martyrs. So it seems that there is some set quantity of righteous suffering that will occur before Christ's return. So with each episode of Christian persecution, as the righteous, as Christians endure persecution, there's that much less of that set quantity of righteous suffering to be experienced. And so the day draws closer as Christians suffer. You see, that's what, I, that's what I think he's doing. I think that's, that idea lies behind the exhortation in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, where he says, to encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. They see the day of judgment drawing near. They see the day of judgment approaching as they see Christians suffer for their faith. As they see Christians enduring persecution, which is what's happening in Hebrews. He writes to, to strengthen these, uh, these Christians who are undergoing persecution, difficulty, and suffering. So he says, you need to encourage people all the more as you see the day approaching. All the more as you see them enduring suffering. See, so he's telling them, listen, you need to be diligent in encouraging. Double that when you see them suffer. Isn't that when people need encouragement? Well, when they're getting the hammer, right? I mean, it's not when they're visually seeing, well, the day's coming. That's an encouraging thing. It's when they're suffering, and when you see the day approaching in their suffering because their suffering is gobbling up some of the set quantity of suffering. So he says, listen, and this is almost certainly, I think that's the idea in Hebrews 10.25, but it's almost certainly the idea behind Paul's enigmatic statement. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, where Paul says, Now I rejoice in the sufferings on your behalf, and I fill up in my flesh, in my flesh, what is lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I fill up in my flesh what is lacking with regard to Christ's afflictions? For the sake of the church, now obviously Paul's filling a deficiency, a lack in Christ's affliction doesn't mean that Christ's death lacks anything in atoning or reconciling efficacy. You see that in Colossians 1.20, 1.22, all over the New Testament. So he's, he can't be saying that, that Christ's death lacks anything in atoning or reconciling efficacy. Rather, Christ's afflictions... You see, what he's talking about, Christ's afflictions, it refers to what in Jewish apocalyptic literature was called the woes or the birth pangs of the Messiah. Okay, the Jewish idea, what's, what's going on, the Jewish idea was that the, the, the Messiah's coming, the Messianic age, it would be preceded by a period of suffering of God's people. God's people would suffer prior to the arrival of the Messiah. And this idea is continued in the New Testament, but it's continued in a modified form. The coming age, Christ has already come. He has inaugurated or begun the kingdom. But we live in this overlap of ages that I've talked about, you know, maybe ad nauseum for you. I don't know. But I've talked about it a lot because I think it's a very foundational and fundamental idea of New Testament theology that the old age or order continues on but the new has broken into this age and we live in an overlap of ages where the kingdom of God is a present reality Christ has pulled the future into the now and there is this overlap so the kingdom of God is a present reality he's broken in but we still see what death mourning suffering crying pain sin 
All of these things that are hallmarks of the old age and order. So we're in this overlap of ages. And so this idea of suffering the birth pangs of the Messiah, this dual state, this overlap of ages will continue until Christ's return. And the woes of the Messiah from Jewish apocalyptic literature, these birth pangs of the Messiah, the afflictions of Christ, they continue in this overlap of ages in the sufferings of God's people. Remember when Paul, when Paul is confronted by Jesus, and what does Jesus say to him? He says, why do you persecute me? What do you mean persecute you, Lord? I'm after these guys. Well, you see there is an identification between Christ and his people. And in the sufferings of his people, these are the birth pangs, the sufferings, the woes of the Messiah that continue in this overlap of ages in the sufferings of his people. And that will go on in this dual age till those sufferings reach their appointed limit. Then Christ will return, consummating the age to come. That's when he comes. That's when you have the final consummating history-ending judgment where all that is contrary to the eternal will of God is stripped out and the kingdom of God is the sole reality for eternity. You see, so this idea, I think he's talking about the sufferings of his people and Paul rejoices in Colossians 1.24 because his bodily sufferings, they contribute to the total sufferings to be endured before the consummation of the age to come. He's thankful that he is gobbling up a disproportionate share of the suffering so there will be less for other people. That's what I think he means. When he says, listen, now I, he says, I rejoice in the sufferings on your behalf and I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. I am taking, if you read Paul's life, you see how he suffered. Kicked all over the Mediterranean. You know? Uh, you know how shipwrecked, stoned, whipped. I mean, this guy took it. And so he can say to the Colossians, I'm thankful. That I am taking that, a disproportionate share. Not only is he in that way drawing the consummation closer by taking up more of that set quantity of righteous suffering. But he's taking a disproportionate share of it and therefore freeing others from it. Okay, whether you agree with that, I think that's what he's talking about. Now, he says here at the end, he says, but in accordance, verse 13, but in accordance with this prom, his promise, we are awaiting a new heaven's and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. A new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The new heavens and new earth, they will come through this purifying fire that, he is, that he's described, you see, and it's, it's described here as a reality what, in which righteousness dwells. What does that mean for the false teachers and their followers? They're out. They're out, you see. So here we have this creation that suffered in the fall, it is marred by sin, cursed by God, and this thing will come through the purifying fire that he's talking about, and it will come out the other side as a purified new heavens and new earth. Where righteousness dwells, we will live in resurrection bodies in that reality. And here's what Douglas Moo says. We live in a world, in his commentary on 2 Peter, we live in a world where wrong often prevails. Now, who can't amen that? Okay? A world in which faithful Christians are often persecuted for doing God's will. They are killing people all over the world. People who claim the name Jesus, profess Jesus, are being killed all over the world. Today. And he says, a world in which faithful Christians are often persecuted for doing God's will while evil people enjoy the rewards of their sin. A world in which innocent lives are ripped from wombs. We abort like 1.6 million babies a year. And I'm telling you, if you've never looked into this, you say that's a political issue. You go look at pictures of those children who are torn in half and burned. I, it just drives me crazy. You go look at the pictures of that. You wouldn't put up with that from an eagle egg. And yet we sit here and go, that's fine. Just go ahead. You just keep dismembering those children. Okay, I'm getting off on it. All right. 
Lives ripped from wounds and God's laws. He says, he says flaunted. He meant flouted, uh, disregarded, and mocked. All that will be eradicated in the next world. As John puts it in Revelation 21, 3 and 4. Now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. This is the Christian hope. This is what this is the Christian hope. It is not simply to live as disembodied spirits somewhere. It is that we will be reconstituted physical beings, not like this though, resurrected beings, and we will live in a perfect reality, a divine utopia. And we will live there forever in the very presence of God in a state of love and fellowship that will just blow your mind. It is what we are shooting for here. We are a pale reflection of it. We are called to manifest that not yet, to be that now, in the overlap of ages. But at that time, it's going to be perfect, it's going to be full. Now, rather than annihilating the first heaven and earth and replacing it with something entirely new, the idea is that the first heaven and earth will be reduced to another form. You see, and then be reconstituted as something radically different. It's going to be reduced to another form and then reconstituted. It is not going to be scrapped in my judgment. It is not going to be scrapped and then something completely new will begin. It's analogous to the transformation of our bodies in the resurrection. You see, there is, there is both continuity. That is, I'm the same, I am the person who's coming through this resurrection. There's continuity. It is not I'm thrown away and a new thing is created. Totally new. There's continuity, but there's also discontinuity. Because who comes through this resurrection is not going to be this person who's subject to death, decay, and all of that. So there is continuity and discontinuity. There is a radical transformation, but it's still me coming through it. And that's the same idea it is with the creation itself. There is a redemption of creation that is analogous to the redemption of people. As we will live in that redeemed creation and resurrection bodies, the creation itself is going to pass through that purifying fire. It is going to be reduced in some way to a different form and then be reconstituted as a new reality in which we will live. And I just think, it's, I've told you before, I remember when I first was, just decades ago, I was telling some people at the White Station Church in Memphis, I was teaching a young class, I was telling them this. And they'd grown up in the church and they were just floored by it. And they'd gotten the idea that, no, that the end game was the intermediate state of the dead. We're just going to float around and be non-material beings. And that would strike any Jew. That's not life, that's death. <laughs> you see, now the intermediate state, we could talk about that. I think it's going to be grand. It's going to be great. We're going to be in the blessed presence of Jesus. But that's not the end. That's not the end. The end is the new heavens and new earth where we'll live forever in resurrection bodies. See, the continuity aspect, it's, there's both continuity and discontinuity, and you can see the continuity aspect here in Jesus' reference in Matthew 20, 19, 28 to what? The renewal of all things. You see, he speaks of the renewal of all things. You see that there. In Peter's comment in Acts 3.21 that God would what? Restore everything. And in Paul's statement in Romans 8.21 that creation would be liberated from its slavery to decay. It's the creation is not going to be scrapped and something entirely new begun. Rather, creation will be transformed. It will be liberated from its slavery to decay. It is passing through a transforming event. So it's going to pass through this purifying fire and it's going to come out reconstituted as the new heavens and new earth. And we will live there forever. And we will be squeezing each other there. Rejoicing, partying, celebrating, praising, living. Living in fullness of life forever. And the people sometimes say, well, you know, I'm going to get tired, you know, I just get bored. And I've told people in a kind of perverse analogy, I've heard, you know, people who, you know, either take ecstasy or whatever drug of your choice is, I've heard people come and say, first time I had that, 
I got to a place I never wanted to leave. I said, oh, that sounds good to me because that's how heaven's going to be. And by heaven, I mean the new heavens and new earth. You see, it is going to be a place you don't have to worry about. Well, will I get bummed? Will I be bored? Will I be... No. (laughs) You see, I can't imagine that. I'm sure you can't. You see, but you're just going to have to trust that it is going to be absolutely, completely, totally, thoroughly fulfilling. And it'll be that forever. And I just think it's the grandest thing. Now, it's also suggested this idea about continuity and discontinuity, that this, there's a continuation here. It's also suggested in many Jewish apocalyptic writings. Okay, let me tell you what Richard Balkum, this is a kind of a specialty of his. He says, such passages in these Jewish apocalyptic writings emphasize the radical discontinuity between the old and the new, but it is nevertheless clear that they intend to describe a renewal, not an abolition of creation. Now, there are theologians, there are people, I think, perhaps primarily of a Lutheran stripe who favor a scrapping and a completely new beginning. But I don't see that. I don't see God giving up on creation for the reasons I've you know, mentioned. He's redeeming creation. He didn't lose that round. Okay, round one to you, I'll start over. No. He's redeeming creation. People are going to be resurrected and live there forever. All right, coming to the last section. 314 to 18. Therefore, beloved, since you are awaiting these things, strive to be found spotless and blameless by him at peace and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as indeed he does in all his letters, speaking in them about these things. In them are some things that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist, as they also do the other scriptures, to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, since you already know this, be on your guard, lest being carried away by the error of lawless men, you fall from your own stable position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. All right, since they're looking forward to Christ's return and the things associated with it that he's been talking to them about, that he obviously knows they already know because it's part of apostolic teaching, since they're looking forward to those things, they need constantly to look beyond the circumstances of this life and to gauge every thought and every action in light of the eternal state that Christ in his glory will bring. You see, this is this idea I say it feeds into. You need to live in light of the future. See, that's why I like that that show, which I can never think of the name of, but with Sarah Connor. Right? I mean, I love that. Because Terminator, all right, that's right. Can I call a friend? Yeah, Terminator. You see, I mean, that idea where, you know, they're living here because they know the future and everybody thinks they're crazy. Their whole lives are dedicated to what? Fighting the machines. People are going, you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. What are you doing? What are you doing? Why are they doing it? Because they know the future. And you can't convince them they don't. Everybody says, you're crazy. I say, okay, I know the future. I know this is happening. And so you live in light of what you know. That's what he's telling them. You see, you live in light of that. They know it. They need to act that way. Specifically, they need to strive to be found spotless and blameless by God on that day. Do you see what it means for Christian ethics, Christian living? You see, there's no room in Christianity for the idea, listen, don't worry about ethics. Don't worry about what God wants you to do. That's crazy. You see, I understand I don't earn and achieve my standing before God, but don't think that God is ethically neutral. That's their position. That's the position of the false teachers. So when you say that, you're casting your lot with them, and that's the wrong side of this. You see, it's very important. It's very important. Here's what Moose says. Peter's point is clear. Motivated by the day of the Lord that is coming, believers should work hard to be found perfectly pure and blameless when God in Christ assesses their lives. They should strive to be the opposite of the false teachers who are blots and blemishes. Okay, well, they are to be what? They're to be pure and blameless, unlike the false teachers who are blots and blemishes because they say, listen, it doesn't matter how you live. It's your life. You're the king. Do whatever you want, how you want, when you want. 
Don't worry about this God thing. He's just like a big parent in the sky. Just push him off into a closet somewhere. Okay, he says, look, that they should strive to be the opposite of the false teacher or blots and blemishes, 2.13. Remember, however, that this is a goal we are to strive for, not a condition that we will finally be able to achieve. For the New Testament makes clear that the believers will always have sin to confess and that our struggle with sin will never finally end until our bodies, our bodies themselves are redeemed, Romans 8.23. But this realization should not diminish our sincere effort to get as close to that goal as possible. So we are to strive, to labor, to be righteous, holy, godly people, and to call one another to be that. Will we achieve that? Will we ever sit here and say, I've arrived, I'm sinless, not on this side of the second coming? But does that mean then that we should say, well, you're not going to make that? You know, I sin, you sin, we all sin, so who cares? Six and one half dozen the other, why should I care about sinning? You see? Is that, the, is that the view of Scripture? It isn't. The view of Scripture is strive, labor, pursue. Take seriously what God has called you to be. Live that way. That's how we're to be. Will you fail? Yes. And don't hide it. Don't lie about it. Confess it. Get up. Get back on. Right? But this is the thing, and I think this is very important for the church to see and to understand. In other words, they are to strive to be found at peace with God, meaning to be found living in submission to Him rather than in rebellion to Him. None of this rebellion stuff against God. The attitude of God always is, this is the expression. Does that communicate to you? Just God, you're God. What is your will for my life? None of this, say, hey, hey pal, who are you? I don't care what you want, right? We can't be that way. We are the people who've come to Christ and said, thank you, Lord Jesus. So we are to be holy, righteous, sacrificial, loving people. And you tell me that wouldn't affect the world? That's what affected the world early on. If you've read church history, people saw, people saw the church and how radical it was. And they said, whew. In fact, uh, Justin Martyr, one of the things that drew him was, People here living this way and then dying for it. That got his attention. And he became one of the great apologists of the second century. But this idea, it will transform things. And it will have a tremendous impact on people's lives. See, we're to strive. They must guard against the false teacher's lie that it doesn't matter how one lives. When somebody starts telling you that, you don't have to worry about that. You're just hung up on works. You see, that's a very sneaky little idea. I'm not hung up on them, you see. I know, I know where my righteousness lies, but I am not going to turn that into a license to rebel against God. That's not, what I, that, that's not the goal. What I want to do is to live to please Him. Life is to be an expression of gratitude toward Him. It is not, how can I figure out to get out from under Daddy? That's not what it's about. But so when you hear that, see, you, you just have to be tuned in. Now, can people, can, can people become uh, legalists? Of course they can. Can people start to, start to tell people that your standing before God is a function of your performance and you earn it and you need to sweat about that because you are achieving? Yeah, they can do that. But you know better, right? You read the Bible. So you know better than that. So this is the idea. I think it's important that they not listen. All right. They're to regard the patience of our Lord, which chapter 3, verse 9 makes clear, refers to the time he waits before bringing the final judgment. They are to regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. So that's how we are to regard it. They are to recognize that the time before Christ's consummating return, that is an opportunity to repent to repent of any rebellion into which they may have fallen, been drawn by the false teachers. He's writing to this community that's under assault. Don't you think there's some people there who've been pulled, influenced, thinking, leaning, have gone over to him a little bit? He's saying you, you are to regard his patience, his waiting to come as salvation, as an opportunity for you to repent while that door is open. You see, if you have fallen and been drawn into this and swallowed some of their teaching after Peter has said what he said he says listen regard 
His patience as salvation. Come home, baby! You see, whatever you've done, however often you've done it, however deeply involved in it you've been, the door is open. Come home. You see? There is no sin that will put you beyond the grace of God other than your refusal to come home. You see, so this is the idea regarded as salvation, and he may even have in here regarding the time before the final judgment as salvation might imply a responsibility to bring others to a knowledge of Christ while that door is still open. That door is not going to remain open forever. He's coming, and when he comes, it's too late. See, when he comes, it's too late. You know, the text where he sits there, beat on the door, hey, open up, open up. I never knew you. You see, the door is closed. He notes that Paul, whom he calls our dear brother, also had written to them about the need to live holy lives in light of Christ's coming. He mentions Paul here is is in accord with this. Now, he probably cites Paul's agreement because I'm guessing that these false teachers, they had distorted Paul's teaching. So they're trying to claim Paul on their side, and Peter turns around and says, Paul and I are like this. We're singing, we're singing the same song. Paul says the same thing. You see, he says the same thing about living holy lives in light of Christ's coming. Now, we don't know the letter to which Peter's referring here. And he says he, that Paul wrote to you. We don't know what he's referring to other than it was directed to the, the audience that, that Peter's writing to. But as Douglas Moose says, Paul touches on this subject in virtually every letter he wrote. Hmm. Hark. All right. Yeah, all right. So, we don't, so, so here he notes that, that Paul wrote to them according to the wisdom, get, wisdom given to him, meaning, of course, given by God. So here's Peter's recognition that God is working through Paul in the things that Paul wrote. He understands that. And he adds that Paul writes by that divine lit wisdom in all his letters, and he speaks in them about these things, about holy living in light of Christ's return. Now, Peter's referring to those letters of Paul of, w- w- that he knew about. You don't have to think that he's referring to the entire corpus of Paul's letters, but all those he was aware of, he's willing to say that Paul addresses and touches on this same subject, that you need to live holy lives in light of the fact a day is coming when there will be an assessment of were you in with me or were you out? Were you, had you cast your lot with me? Were you a disciple? Were you interested in my things? Were you living for my things? Or were you just saying you were and living for yourself? You see, Paul's all over that. And Paul, people twist Paul's word. He says that, that Paul wrote some things that are hard to understand. Now, he probably means that some of his statements easily could be misunderstood if they were removed from their context. Because he speaks of people who twist them. Okay, so, so in other words, there is a norm there. There is a message that, that Paul intended that somebody was able to twist. And what I think he means is, listen, they contain things that are hard to understand if you take them out. He wrote things that when isolated from their context seem to mean things that Paul never intended. If I just take this line that Paul said, I can use that and twist it. Because standing alone, this sounds like it means this. Whereas we know in the context of Paul's whole discussion, that's not what it meant. And you say, well, where can you... Paul pointed to examples of people doing that kind of thing. Like, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, everything is permissible for me. They're citing Paul back to him and using it to justify something Paul would never justify, wouldn't accept. And you can see that same idea in Romans 3, 8 and 6, 1. James also was probably dealing with twisting of Paul's teaching in James 2, 14 to 26. All right, Peter labels those who twist Paul's teaching as ignorant and unstable. No doubt referring to the false teachers because he's referred to the false teachers as unstable in chapter 2, verse 14. Now, they apparently cited Paul in defending their position. Probably, I'm thinking, they would say, listen, Paul's all about grace. You know, you don't have to be saved by grace through faith, not by works. You see that these people who are talking about works, works, do, do, need to be faithful, need to, ah, oh, they're all legalists, so Paul's with me. Okay, that's a misunderstanding of Paul. Do you understand? Paul would be the last person in the world. Look at Paul's life. Look at his life. You think he sits here and says, this is great. Now let me just kick back and act like Christ never died for me. 
But I'll just keep saying, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. He gave, his life was poured out in service. So that's it. All right. Peter says their twisting of Paul's writings was, was in keeping with how they twist other scriptures. Okay, so clearly he recognizes Paul's writing as having a status equal to that of the Old Testament scriptures. Because he says they twist other scriptures. These people don't stop with Paul, they twist all kinds of stuff. And so here you see Peter saying, yes, we have a, uh, you know, that, that Paul's writing a scripture. Moose says, as a metaphor for judgment, the word destruction, this is their fate, they're going to be destroyed, meaning they're going to be eternally condemned. The word destruction does not carry the literal meaning of annihilate or cease to exist, but with salvation as its opposite denotes the eternal loss of fellowship with God. Since they know with certainty that the, the coming final judgment, they know, they know the certainty of that, of the coming final judgment, the kind of lives they should live in light of that judgment, and they know the fate of those who deny those truths, they then have to be on their guard against being carried away by the false teachers so that they don't fall from their stable position. This is how he's ending, saying, listen, you need to be on your guard and not let these people pull you. I know they, they have high-sounding nonsense. I know they, they have a good rap. But you need to stand strong and firm in the truth that Christ has called you to follow his path. You are saved by faith through grace, not by works. We all understand that, but we are called to be radically righteous in this world. And these people who are saying that that's not true and you just go ahead and join me in my pursuit of adultery and all these other things, that is a lie straight out of hell. And he says, you need, if you hang just a couple seconds. All right. He says, rather than being pulled away by the error of the false teachers, what are they? They're to grow spiritually, grow in their responsiveness to Christ's transforming grace and the knowledge of him. That's how we are to be, right? Growing. The spirit within us. Just transforming us so that we become like this flower or like a butterfly or whatever. We are being changed by him as we yield to his transforming effect in our lives. And we're just, just growing up into God. You see, that's what he urges them to do. And he ends with a doxology, an expression of praise directed to the Lord Jesus. Where he simply says, to him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Next week, Lord willing, thank you.